IEL has historically worked hard to stay ahead of the curve, to, to be attentive to what was coming next in terms of the educational policy arena and um, how policymakers and leaders on the ground needed to respond. My fellow Americans, I am about to sign into law the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The mid-1960s were a time of great turmoil for our country, and it was out of that turmoil that IEL emerged. It was when a group of forward-thinking leaders realized there was a need for a new kind of leadership in Washington to respond to the challenges of implementing the Elementary Secondary Education Act. Our oldest running program is the Education Policy Fellowship Program, and it was created to bring in education leaders from around the country to understand what the new federal law was going to mean and then to send them back prepared to implement it. Over the years, the focus of EPFP shifted. Our society is very fragmented today. It's very politically divided. What IEL tries to create through EPFP is space where people can think and learn and explore together. IEL's shift toward the states reflected a national shift toward the states after the, the Johnson presidency. We created something that was initially called the Associates Program and eventually became the State Education Policy Seminars. And what we saw was, at the state level, was again an absence of a space where policymakers could come together and think outside the realm of the immediate legislative process. Leadership and policy have always been themes of the Institute from its early years. In the last 25 years, we've really focused more on effective strategies, innovative strategies. We've been more locally focused on solutions. We are a very diverse country, and there's always been tension so in the 1980s, um, IEL created the Center for Demographic Policy, led by a demographer named Bud Hodgkinson. And then he wrote another paper called All One System, which argued that those systems had to work together more effectively. We've created in the 1990s a program called Superintendents Prepared which was a precursor of some of the national cohort programs for developing superintendents. You could look at the history of our work and see how the themes of looking across systems, looking at children as whole people, uh, has now come together in the work of the Coalition for Community Schools. If kids are coming to school hungry, if kids are homeless, if kids have all these challenges in their communities, if there's high unemployment, if there's all of these other issues it's not to say that learning can't take place, but those are serious challenges, and those are challenges that schools can't handle and shouldn't handle by themselves. The Institute for Educational Leadership is all about working across boundaries. The Center for Workforce Development was founded back in 1991. Employers have been saying for a long time that kids coming out of school aren't prepared to come to work and we have really uh, spent a lot of time in the last couple of decades doing a lot of research about what it is young people need to make that successful transition. The Center for Workforce Development is currently in its 12th year of running the National Collaborative on Workforce and Disability for Youth. One of the things that the Institute tries to do as a core part of its work is to bridge research and practice. And we do that by trying to create frameworks and tools that help local leaders apply what we've learned, do their work in a more effective way. Back in 2004, we created the Guidepost for Success. And the Guidepost for Success is a framework that looks at what young people need, not what the system needs to do, but what young people need in order to make a successful transition from school to work, from home to community, from adolescence to adulthood. As IEL looks to the future, we believe that the leadership programs are not preparing people 
for the challenges they face in educating kids in the 21st century. We talk a lot about the achievement gap, and that's a very important gap, but we also have to talk about the opportunity gap. Because unless young people are getting the experiences, the support that they need, they're just always behind. We think we need a stronger focus on equity. We need a stronger focus on partnership. We need people who can balance the accountability demands of the society with the importance of having trust. Moving forward, we really need to get policymakers at all levels to understand that equity cuts across disability, race, poverty, gender, not break it up into different silos. We need to bust down these silos and get these programs to work together in a much more effective way. But one of the things that we're most excited about is our district leaders network, where we are, we've basically created a peer learning and action network of our people who coordinate family and community engagement at the school district level. We need a constant chain and pipeline of new leaders coming, and we also at the same time need to have existing leaders improve their practice if we're ever gonna to get to the results we need. And that's what IEL does. Our networks are crucial for our success, and they always have been. So these themes of the way IEL has done its work, I think remain at the heart of our work, and the importance of having trusted, credible intermediary institutions is more important now than it ever has been.